Today, I want to begin a series, a teaching series called I Disagree. I Disagree. Uh, everybody turn to your neighbor and say, I disagree. Okay, I, I saw someone down here, she had no problem, young person, saying, I disagree. Okay, we are living in a culture today where there is an enormous amount of disagreement, isn't there? And uh, it is critical that we would become proficient at navigating uh, the conflict in our culture and bringing about peace, amen? Now, just to get us started here today, there's a video that I'm going to show you, and maybe you had an experience like this this week. Check this out. Oh, I don't know. The Irish cream sounds good, huh? What's that? Uh, it's cream and it's, uh, it's Irish. Hurry up and order! Excuse me. Thank you. Um, how about a smoothie? What's in that? Smoothie's a juice drink. We want coffee. Buddy, relax. No, you relax. I'm a regular here. This line needs to move. I beg your pardon. Do you have scones? Tall, non-fat, double latte. Sir, you're at the back of the line. I recognize that. Cut it out or you're out of here. You can't kick me out. You know what? You're, you're really invading my ear space. Look, I'm a frequent coffee drinker. I'm part of the club. I have a card. Do you have a card? Do you have a card? No, I don't have Does a card. Does anyone here have a card? We don't have frequent drinker cards. It's a video club card. Ah! Zip it there, Sporty Spice. Are we doing this? Oh. Is this happening now? Yeah. Come on, Sir, I'd Let's love do to. it. Oh, oh, oh. You're hurting me! You're hurting me! I don't know. I don't know who was in a coffee line or in a line this past week, or maybe you were driving and you were stuck. People were moving too slow and you were getting frustrated, and there was a disagreement. I can't imagine that anyone went through the week this past week without, in some way, using those words. I disagree. And uh, the reality is that we're going to experience conflict in relationships. We experience conflict every day. Not necessarily a bad thing, but it can become a bad thing. One of the reasons is because of our diversity. We are different. Some of us are slow movers, some of us are fast movers. Some of us are organized, and others of us are organic. Uh, We approach life, we see life differently, and because of that, we can find ourselves in messy relationships. In addition to diversity, uh, we have difficulty. We are stressed out. And a lot of times, disagreement occurs when we're stressed out and we're in the midst of life circumstances that are just rough, and they have us just to the point of exploding, and then that occurs in our lives. And so um, we are going to experience this, and the hope would be that we would live peace- peacefully even when relationships are messy. Now, I think there is no greater time in my lifetime, that our culture has been more divided. I'm not, I I don't think there's been a greater time. Uh, We are living in a time, in fact, we've just come through a season where as a pastor engaging in a lot of conversations, there is a significant amount of extended families that we're divided, are divided over masks and vaccines and politics. We're living in that time. The Twitter feed today is fraught with disagreement and division. We are raising a generation that is educated to question everything, and we celebrate individualism. And I think the problem with that is that we have a generation sometimes that's growing up that can't respond to authority, because I need to challenge everything. There has never been a time in my lifetime where there's been more conflict over the sexes, races, religion, political parties. The news is full of stories about prejudice, racism, tribalism, terrorism, and partisanism. And the result is broken relationships, a broken economy, broken marriages, broken government, and probably the worst of all is broken hearts. 
We are living in this time. And the good news is that Jesus desires something better, and he has made a way for something better. Amen? Jesus said this, blessed, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now, there's two things in that. First of all, that when you live in peace, when you make peace, you are blessed. Live a blessed life. Uh, the second thing, though, is he says, you'll be called a child of God. Now, my child are a reflection of me. And so why will you be called a child of God when you make peace? Because God is a peacemaker, and maybe you're no more like God than when you're making peace with people and making peace with God. And so the title of the message today is Peacemaking More Than Peacekeeping. I want to invite you today to be a peacemaker, not just a peacekeeper. Some of you, I mean, it's, it's not that difficult to keep the peace. It is sometimes difficult to make peace. But we are no more like God than we, when we are pursuing peace in our lives and in our world. Amen? Uh, there's several spiritual problems with unresolved conflict that I just want to lay out there this morning, make sure we're on the same page. First problem with conflict in your life with other people is, first of all, it blocks our fellowship with God. Blocks our fellowship with God. First John 4, 11 through 20 says this, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We love one another. God abides in us, and his perfect love is perfected in us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. God is saying that you can't be right with God if you're wrong with people. The vertical has a direct impact on the horizontal. And if you are loved by God and he has made peace with you, then you are called to make peace with others. And the moment that you say, you know what, I, I just, I'm done. I, I, I'm done. It blocks your fellowship with God. It impacts your fellowship with God. Second problem with unresolved con uh, conflict is it blocks our prayers. It blocks our prayers. First Peter 3, 7 Husbands, listen to this for a moment. Peter says this, Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor so that your prayers may not be hindered. He clearly says here that, you know, if you're living out of peace with people, it affects your vertical relationship with God. It affects our prayers. Our lives will not be as fruitful. Our lives will not be as peaceful and as blessed. Now let me just note this, that in conflict, some have said that there are skunks and there are turtles. Think about who you are just for a moment. Skunks make a stink. Everybody knows about it when they're in conflict. They stink it up. Turtles retract into the shell. The problem is that skunks marry turtles. And so you can today just figure out which one are you. You can have a discussion about that. Um, unresolved conflict blocks our fellowship with God. It blocks our prayers. And lastly, it blocks our joy. James 3.18 says this, A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. It's sown in peace. And so what I want to do today is I want to give five seeds to sow peace. Now, I would invite you to take some notes today because if you don't need it right now, there will be the time that you will need it. You'll need to encourage others in it. And I just think this is, you know, pivotal in our lives. So five seeds to sow peace. Now, let me just mention a couple things before we jump in. First of all, um, much of what I am teaching today comes from a book by Ken Sand called The Peacemaker. Okay, if you want more on this, I invite you to read the book. 
but I also just want to give credit to him and also to Rick Warren in a message that he taught on conflict. And what I want you to approach this with today is this picture of a plant. Because peace often is like the growth of a plant. You sow, seed, you sow seeds towards it, and it's not for a time that you reflect all the benefits or the fruits of it. But if we would be persistent in our lives of pursuing peace, of making peace, we know that God will give us a harvest of righteousness and peace. Amen. Let me just pray. I'm going to give you these five seeds. Lord God, I pray right now in this place, Lord, I pray God, that your spirit would invade our lives. God, that your spirit would have full opportunity, opportunity to speak to our hearts today, God. This first and foremost is a heart issue. We need your wisdom today, but God, we need you to make our hearts such that it's flesh and that it can beat in a new way. Bring about peace, Lord. May we be a church. May we be a people that is a pocket of peace and that you put it all over the place in our neighborhoods, in our villages. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, five seeds. It's practical today. Five seeds to sow peace. The first one is this. Begin with weighing the conflict. Okay, weigh the conflict. What I mean by that is weigh it and decide whether it's worth it to have to address it. Okay, Proverbs 19.11, I was studying the peacemaker a couple years ago. We were in a group and we went through this verse and it has saved me an enormous amount of energy and time. Here's what it says. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. It's to your glory when you overlook an offense. Now, the word overlook, I, I looked it up in the original language, it literally means to pass by. When, when there are conflicts that occur in your life, there's many times where you just need to say, this is not worth getting your shorts in a twist over what's going on. I, I'm just going to overlook it. I'm going to move on beyond it, knowing that what is occurring in this conflict is really just coming out of some of the stress and the life circumstances or the different ways that we think. I remember a couple years ago, as we were studying this, I, 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 I think the, the study was early in the morning, and I always like to go home before my kids you know, are leaving for school, but the most stressful time in our home is the morning. I mean, everybody's getting up, we're trying to get the kids ready, we're trying to ensure that the kids are dressed, that the kids make the bus, and sometimes they miss the bus, and did everybody eat, and has everything been taken care of? Well, I was at Mill Pond, our, our, our office location, and you know, I was studying the Word, and I was flowing in the Word, and filled in the Word, and I came home, and to the very back of our house, there's a sliding glass door. I opened the sliding glass door. I don't remember exactly. I think there might have been trash outside the door. And when there's trash outside the door, that's my responsibility, one of the kids' responsibilities. But I walked in, and all of a sudden, whoom. I mean, there was some conflict that occurred about how I opened the door and what was outside the door, and it was clearly all because of the stressful circumstances that were going on that morning at the house. And so I just said, you know, it's to my glory to not even get into this, to not even react to this, to not even argue my point or my place. There's no point in this. It is to your glory to weigh it and ask, is it even worth it? Because sometimes it doesn't really matter whether you're right. And actually, sometimes you think you're right, and you're not really right. So just pass on by it, if it's not worth it. Amen? Begin by weighing it. Second, see the wrong. Sometimes, let me, just, let me just, before I get into this, sometimes it is worth it. Sometimes conflict breaks relationships. It gets 
into a root, and it's like a fire that starts to simmer and smolder inside of you. You know what I'm talking about? And sometimes it is worth addressing it. And so the seed, the next seed that we need to move towards in those moments is that we would see what is wrong in me. And when I say that I'm using that first person, I don't want you to see what's wrong in me. I want you to see what's wrong in you. And when we enter into conflict in our life, we ought to start with like, God, what is wrong in me? Jesus said it this way, take the log out of your own eye before pointing out the speck in your brother's eye. Uh, So many times we have a log and our brother has a speck and we got a lot of, we got no problem pointing that out and not paying attention to our own. I I know, uh, you know, for myself at home sometimes, um, I, I, you know, there's a time where I just kind of go with the flow and there's a time where I'm the football coach. And it's like I walk into the house and I can realize that there's a little bit of stress and, you know, shoes are not being picked up and, you know, coats are not being put away. And I just start to, you know, hey, kids, get out here and move your shoes and all of this. And so, you know, I walked in one day and it was clear that there was a bunch, a big mess around the door. And so I'm just telling the kids, like, you need to get out here and you need to move this and all of this. And... I, I didn't really pay much attention to it, and the kids came out, and, you know, um, I, I really had no grace for them, but they came out, and they were looking at it, and, and, and I, I was like, what, you know, and they said, D- those are your shoes. I mean, you have four pairs of shoes sitting there, and I looked down. And at that point, I decided to exercise some grace, you know. Uh, the, the, there's a time to exercise grace. And, and, and I think sometimes we need to see the wrong that is inside of me. There's two questions that I would invite you to ask when you're in the midst of conflict. And let's, let's get into kind of more the difficult conflict of life. Maybe the, the, the conflict that smolders and it's hard to address in our lives. First question is, is what did I do wrong or what do I do wrong? Like, God, did you just show me? What am I doing wrong? How am I seeing this wrong? But there's a more important question, I believe, that we ought to ask, and it's this. What attitudes are wrong inside of me towards the conflict? What do I do wrong? But what attitudes are inside of me that are wrong pertaining to the conflict? Now, let me read Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21 to you, and I want you to consider your attitude towards other people. Right now, in fact, if you have someone in your life that there's a conflict, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's an extended family member, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's another student at your school, and they've wronged you, maybe somebody has walked out on you. I, I want you to consider that scenario in the context of what I'm going to read just for a moment. Would you do that? Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. It's going to get real here now. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, 
but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I just ask you, is that your attitude to the, towards the person or the people that you are in conflict with? Now, that, uh, that's an abrupt ending, isn't it? Heaping coals on a person's head. I mean, I, I, that's for a sermon for another day, but let me just say this. Here's what the passage is saying. is It's saying there is some people that justly will receive judgment and justice for the wrong things that they have done to you. But that's not your job. That's God's job. Your job is to bless. Your job is to feed. Your job is to give a cup of water. And I'm not talking about not creating boundaries for people that have abused you. Don't let people that have abused you just continue to abuse you. I'm just saying that for the majority of our relationships where there is conflict, God is saying, pursue peace, make peace, work towards peace, be diligent, be persistent in bringing about peace. I don't approach conflict in my life by saying, here's what that person did. I approach it I want to approach it by saying, God, first of all, give me eyes to see inside of me. In fact, the word for see in the New Testament, the Greek word is, is, uh, is skopos. Skopos. Uh, we get the word microscope. What a great prayer. God, put a microscope on me today. What is inside of me that is not of you? that is stealing blessing from my life and blessing from the people around me. Uh, one of the reasons, by the way, we all have blind spots. You know what blind spots are, right? Driving along, I don't see it. And most of the time in conflict, we have some blind spots. We can't see inside of us what we're doing wrong. We can see what they're doing very well, but we can't see what we're doing wrong. And that's why it is critical that we would spend time in the Word, in the Scriptures, okay? When we read the Bible, it reads us. What happens in the chair can't stay in the chair. And so when you get in the chair in the morning and you open up the Word, God just starts to speak into your life and He starts to give you eyes into your, some things in your life that you can't even see because you have blind spots. I remember a couple years ago, there was some anger that was smoldering inside of me. Uh, I felt like someone had done some injustice to me. And I just, it just, it was, it was simmering. It was smoldering inside of me. And I was having a hard time with it. I was spending a lot of time and a lot of energy on it. And I remember one Holy Week, one Passion Week, I, was, I had opened the scriptures and I was just reading through Jesus. I was trying to find, follow Jesus through Passion Week. You know, what happened on Tuesday? What happened on Wednesday? What happened on Thursday? And I got to Friday on Passion Week and I was reading Jesus on the cross. And he said this, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I remember as I was reading that, the, 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 you know, God, the Spirit of God just all of a sudden gave me sight to, to see some attitudes that were wrong in me. And I just said, you know what, God, if, if, if Jesus can forgive them for what they did to him, why can't I forgive someone for what they did to me? Now, a couple things happened when that occurred. First of all, it was like a weight just came off, and I said, it's okay, because God will make things okay in the end. Like, I don't have to 
deal with this any longer because I'm going to put it on God to deal with it. But you know what the second thing was that happened? I started to see some parts to the conflict that I was responsible that I couldn't see before. I started to see some wrong actions inside of me as that occurred in my life. Uh, we need to see what's wrong inside of me and, uh, and, and pursue it. You will never be a peacemaker until you make peace inside of yourself. Some of us need to make peace inside of us. Number three, listen for the story behind the story. So once I've prayed and I've sought the Lord and, and seen, started to see what's inside of me, then I want to approach the person and I want to begin by listening. James 1.19 says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of God does not produce the righteousness. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Be quick to listen. Be quick to ask questions. How many of you know that the presenting problem is normally not the problem in your issues with people? The, 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 pre, the problem that they say is the issue often is not the issue. Often we're arguing over ideas, and it's really emotions. Someone was hurt. Someone felt they let you or that you let them down. Uh, we ought to approach people, and we ought to ask and listen, not approaching them with the intention of just responding and telling them what they've done wrong, but can we ask people? Hurt people hurt people, and injured people injure people, and so we need to approach people and try to understand what is going on in their life. I was thinking about a conversation I was having not too long ago with a person, and, and you know there was another person involved, and it was pretty clear that this other person was just nasty. And the person I was talking to eventually started to ask questions and find out that their life was just broken. They were just struggling, and that was at the root of all uh, the issues in their life. Listen for the story behind the story, be quick to listen. Number four, fourth seed, because there will come a time that you ought to speak. We ought to speak the truth tactfully. Speak the truth tactfully. Uh, Ephesians 4.15 says, speak the truth in love. Some of you would say, you know, I just say how it is. Well, that's rude or ruthless often. Uh, we ought to consider how can we speak the truth in a loving way. Often we can say things and speak things in a way that it doesn't work towards peacemaking, it works towards working against. I mean, it just explodes the situation. Now we're not arguing about the situation or about the emotions. We're arguing about something else that's been said that just uh, made it 10 times worse. Speak the truth tactfully. James 3.6 says this, how great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire setting on fire the course of life. Uh, you are not persuasive when you're abrasive. So let's speak the truth. Let's, let's be wise. I think about some of the people in my life that I've been watching recently. They are just incredible about how they speak, they ask questions, uh, they remove any sort of anger from the issue by just coming, by, about how they come about it. People do not respond to truth when it's, or people will respond to truth when it's wrapped in love, not brought with a club. And so let's speak the truth. Now let me just say one other thing about speaking the truth. Uh, I do not believe that Twitter or most social media is a way to speak truth and love. Most of what I see on there is just arguments and things that can be said uh, without the person sitting there. And so he says, speak it, get together, sit down. Let them see your emotions. Let them see your face. 
and speak the truth. Here's the last seed. Wait. Wait on God. Wait on God. Um, I used both words here of wait because I thought it was interesting as I was just pro- pondering and processing this that, that often uh, when I'm in conflict, when there's a conflict with someone that it requires waiting. It requires, there, there's a time. We're gonna plant the seed and then we're gonna have to wait a little while for God to do the work. I can't change a person. I don't change people. The Spirit of God does. And so I have to wait. And the beautiful thing is that in the waiting, we can put the weight on God. In fact, that very mindset, that very idea is just saying, okay, God, listen, I've, I've done, I, I, I've prayed about this. I've looked inside of me. I've gone to them and I've listened. I've, I've, I've spoken truth tactfully. And now I'm just gonna wait and I'm gonna put the weight on you. And I'm gonna go to sleep tonight. And I'm gonna sleep well. Because I've taken the steps to make peace with people. Amen.